All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Let's give everyone a quick moment to log in, get connected, get settled. Um, hello to everyone who's joined us so far. We're happy you're here. Uh, let's see. It does look like a fair amount of you have joined us so far, and we do have lots to talk about. Good morning. So let's get started. So welcome, everyone, to the Owl Kids Books New and Notable Nonfiction Panel. I'm Taylor Lytle Hewlett, the Marketing and Publicity Coordinator here at Owl Kids Books. I'm excited to be moderating this discussion, which is our first panel of the day. In this discussion, we'll be highlighting our newest nonfiction picture books publishing this fall in conversation with their authors and illustrators. Before we begin, I'd like to gratefully acknowledge that our office in Toronto, which is also where I'm broadcasting from today, is located on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Chippewa, the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, and the Haudenosaunee peoples. I'd also like to acknowledge that the land Toronto sits on is covered by Treaty 13, known as the Toronto Purchase, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaties, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. As publishers of children's books, we take seriously our responsibility to educate our audiences about the history and legacy of colonialism and its impact on Indigenous peoples, and we're dedicated to working towards a just and equitable future. Our panelists and all of our attendees are joining us from many different places today, so I encourage you all to learn more about and reflect on the land you're joining us from and its history. Next, I'd like to introduce our panelists and their books. First up is One Tiny Bubble, the story of our last universal common ancestor, a picture book for ages four to eight, publishing this September. It tells the wondrous true story of one tiny bubble that sparked all life on Earth, Luca, or our last universal common ancestor. It's a tiny organism that can be linked back to every unique life form on Earth. It's written by Karen Crossing and illustrated by Don Lowe, who are both here with us today. Karen Crossing is the author of One Tiny Bubble, Sour Cakes, and Other Stories for Kids and Teens. She recently graduated with an MFA in writing for children and young adults from the Vermont College of Fine Arts. She also conducts writing workshops and book talks. Karen lives in Toronto. Don Lowe is an illustrator whose work has appeared in picture books, stationery, greeting cards, public art installations, and more. Born in Hong Kong, she's currently based in Vancouver, BC. In addition to illustrating books, she spends her time working at the library and reading slice of life mangas. We'll also be talking with the creators of Rock, Plant, Animal, How Nature Keeps Us Guessing. The book is an interactive guessing game featuring some of nature's most unusual adaptations and characteristics. Each spread invites readers to guess whether the object they're looking at is a rock, plant, or animal, with the page turn revealing the answer and showing the object in its natural habitat. The book is for ages four to eight and publishes in September, and the creators are here with us today as well. Etta Kaner is the author of Rock, Plant, Animal, How Nature Keeps Us Guessing, as well as many other nonfiction books about nature. Her science books have won numerous awards, and Etta lives in Toronto, where she gets much of her inspiration from working in her garden. The illustrator of the book is Brittany Lane. Brittany Lane is a children's book illustrator and fine artist currently based in Stouffville. She, works, she worked as a wildlife biologist for a decade before turning to visual storytelling as a way to share her passion for and understanding of nature and wildlife with others. So a warm welcome to our four panelists. Um, panelists, please join us with your cameras on and we will get started. So hello, hello everyone. Um, before we get started, a quick note to our attendees. We will have a few minutes at the end for questions, so please feel free to type any questions you may have into the Q&A area at the bottom of your screen, and feel free to use the chat function to say hello. I see some of you have already, so hi. Um, and now on to our questions. So my first question, these books both have really unique and interesting subject matter. So I'd love to hear what moment or idea sparked the creation of these books from the authors. Um, so Karen, maybe let's start with you. Sure, thanks. And thanks for hosting us, Taylor. Um, I was watching an episode of the documentary One Strange Rock and um, Will Smith said something about Luca, our last universal common ancestor. 
I immediately grabbed a notebook and started writing notes because I thought this is a great picture book idea. Uh, the idea of one single cell that sparked all life that's currently on earth was just awe inspiring and heartwarming. And it's like about the power of um, a small thing to become something huge. And it represents, you know, our commonality as well as uh, celebrating all the diversity of the species on earth. So I just couldn't resist. It is a very irresistible topic. It's so interesting. Um, Edda, what about you? Well, I'm sorry to disappoint. <laughs> if you'd asked me the same question about uh, another owl book that just came out, Dig, Dance, Dive, I'd say, yes, I remember the exact conversation I had a, with um, an ornithologist friend of mine. It was just a sentence that he said, uh, birds don't just fly. But in this case, um, I really don't remember the exact point. What often happens is I'll be researching for another book and I come across a statement um, in a piece of uh, uh, research and that'll spark something and then that'll spark me onto another idea and finally something develops. So in, in this book, I can't really pinpoint an exact spark. It must have been an organic spark kind of throughout time. Um, so kind of jumping off from that, the moment that sparked the manuscripts, um, I'm interested as illustrators, Don and Brittany, what were your first thoughts when the manuscripts were presented to you? Um, was there a moment or a concept that drew you into the project? Um, maybe Don, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Um, so I remember when I first read the manuscript of One Tiny Bubble, um, I just thought it was so poetic and so lovely. Uh, I remember while reading the script too, in my head, I already have like images of um, having like the beginning of the time or also having different living organism popped up. Um, I think I'm also really drawn to the fact that even though it's a nonfiction piece, there's um, a lot of room uh, for me to explore the narrative within. And also it's, it can be simple too, the moment and concept that drew me in is the name Luca. It's just, it has such a great uh, character within the name itself. Um, it's just so fun and so full of possibility. So yeah, um, I think that's fun. And you did a great job bringing Luca to life. <laughs> um, Brittany, what about you? Yeah, I was uh, really excited when I got the manuscript. Um, it was mostly, I would say, what captured my attention was just the fact that the story was actually written as a guessing game. Um, and that just felt really unusual and intriguing to me. And I felt like it would be probably pretty intriguing to young readers as well. Um, so that was really what grabbed my attention. Um, and that even the page turns would be part of this guessing game. Um, so for kids reading it or kids and parents together, it would be this exciting sort of event. Um, and then outside of that, I was really intrigued by all of the different creatures and um, rocks and plants that Etta actually found um, to write about. Um, as a biologist formerly, I hadn't actually heard of a lot of these creatures. So it was just interesting uh, the prospect of learning about these creatures more and trying to figure out how to best portray them. It actually leads very well into my next question, the guessing game element. Um, so something that I find really interesting about both of these books is that they both take scientific topics, but they approach them in very different ways. So with Rock Plant Animal, there's that interactive and game-like element, and One Tiny Bubble still takes an informational approach, but like a poetic, almost meditative approach. So I'm wondering for the authors, how did you make the decision to take your books in those directions? Um, so Etta, let's start with you. Um. This wasn't such an anomaly for me because whenever I come up with an idea for a book, the, one of the first things I do, uh, besides researching to see if it's been done before, is um, to, to figure out a way of making the book interactive. So a number 
of my books aren't necessarily guessing games, but there is an interactive element to it. And the other component that I try to put into my book books is point of view or perspective. It's just something that is at the back of my mind whenever I approach a book. And certainly these two elements um, work themselves into a rock plant animal very, very well. And, um, and that's what happened. <laughs> I see. Um, and Karen, what about you? That's interesting, and I would say um, I was trying to get an interactive approach, but in a different way. Um, so I used second person address to the reader, something like uh, you are all part of one Luca family to try and um, make that connection because the book is thematically about connections between that child reader reading the book and Luca, which is a really you know, uh, complex scientific topic. So it's just a different way of being interactive. So that's neat. And the poetic approach was really just because I think the subject matter asked for it, that sort of awe inspiring, miraculous thing that happened 3.5 million years ago, um, wanted to be told poetically. <laughs> It is awe inspiring. It's it's a very interesting concept. Um, and speaking of the concept, um, both of these books deal with scientific concepts, which are things that can be complex or abstract, especially to children. So I'm interested as authors how you worked on making the content accessible for younger readers. Um, if it was a challenge or you had any specific techniques or ideas, I know you talked about that point of view and connection, um, but if there's anything else to add, maybe Karen, if we start with you. Yes, I do think it was a huge challenge to take this concept and, and write it for kids, and I really wasn't sure if I could do it at first. Um, I was working at translating it into a child-centric point of view, and to do this, I was using just really simple yet accurate language um, and relating it wherever I could with things uh, from a child's point of view, like comparing Luca to the size of a sprinkle, a sp uh, you know, on a cupcake, <laughs> um, and using really concrete images and verbs to describe things. Uh, I think those kind of techniques helped to ground it for kids. And I think all those techniques worked very well. Etta, what about you? Yeah, um, I don't have a scientific background. So often it's very challenging for me to, when, when I read a scientific paper, and I read a lot of those, um, to translate it to something that a child will understand. So um, when, I, when I do finally understand it, it's more at a child level. <laughs> Um, so I'm able to, to impart the, the knowledge and uh, hopefully in an interesting way. Um, I use comparisons to um, things that, are, uh, that, that kids are familiar with. That's a, that's a great way to help them understand concepts. Um, I often choose um, what kinds of materials uh, kids would be familiar with. And, and second person is also, Karen, uh, a really great way to help kids understand um, a, a concept that, that might be challenging or difficult. I will say, Edda, you're very good at distilling those scientific papers down for kids. You have a knack for it. Um, my next question is for the illustrators. So I imagine that creating visuals for these concepts must have been interesting and perhaps also a challenging process. Um, Brittany, there's a lot of detail and realism in your illustrations, capturing each little creature and object. Um, and Dawn, you were illustrating cells and exploding stars and approached a really big concept working on this book. So what was that like illustrating for nonfiction and also working towards that goal of making these concepts accessible for young readers. Um, Brittany, I'll start with you. Yeah, certainly. So it was a really interesting challenge. Um, 
And because of the guessing game nature of rock plant animal, we decided early on that we wanted to showcase each rock plant and animal as accurately as we could, because we figured it would actually help to challenge young readers um, make, and make the game a little bit more exciting and just sort of trick them a little bit. Um, but it was also um, difficult to sort of strike a balance. We wanted to challenge young readers, but we also didn't want to overcomplicate images or anything like that as well. Um, so it took a lot of research into each element of the book um, to figure out how to portray things in a tricky way, um, but not too tricky. So um, yeah, the spot illustrations were a really unique challenge, trying to sort of bend creatures in odd positions to make it look a little bit more, more challenging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think you struck that balance really well, that tricky, not too tricky, tricky. I personally struggled with guessing a couple of them. I think a couple of us in this call have as well. Um, Dawn, what about you? Yeah, um, for me, I think during this drafting drafting stage, I was really creating illustration that's highlight like the keywords from the text, like like Karen was saying, some vocabulary that she used to um, for comparison um, to make it more accessible for younger kids, like cupcake spring bowl that Karen mentioned earlier. I remember in the drafting stage, I drew a curious child scientist holding a cupcake, but also comparing the size to Luca. Um, but then after talking to the team and establishing we, maybe we should refrain from introducing anything that is not part of the Luca world or time prior to the shift of the text. So um, that also opens a lot of room, but also like a lot of challenges too, um, to really explore what to do for the first couple of spreads where it mainly talks about Luca and um, what Luca is like. Um, but I also kind of like how the book itself now has kind of trans um, transformed within itself where it started off more like painterly, really focusing on the cells and Luca itself. And then with more, mostly the shape, but now, um, and then it, as the books introduce more living things, um, more, recognizable organism uh, are present. So yeah, the, the style kind of shifted too, which I, I, I like how organic it became. Yeah. yeah, you definitely feel that while reading the book, it kind of zooms out again and again as you're watching from the cell to the organisms and it keeps going. Um, I'm going to, just a reminder to our attendees, this is gonna be my last question before we open it up to a QA. and a So if anybody watching has any questions, feel free to leave them in the Q&A box. Um, my personal last question is for everybody. So working on nonfiction, I assume there must've been quite a bit of research, um, both as authors and as illustrators. So how did you each go about that process? And I'm interested in learning about that. Um, Edda, let's start with you. Okay. Um, the, the hardest part of the research, I think, is slogging through um, <laughs> research by professionals, by, by scientists, uh, because they have their own special language and it needs a lot of translation. <laughs> and I see Karen nodding, <laughs> and I think she knows what I'm talking about. Um, and but th there are a number of sites that are a lot more accessible, uh, like the Smithsonian, um, San Diego Zoo, uh, uh, aquariums, uh, Pacific Aquarium. But my favorite part of research really is either emailing or even better, phoning somebody up <laughs> out of the blue and saying, I'm a Canadian author, I'm a published Canadian author, so they know I'm not just <laughs> uh, pulling their leg. And I'm, I need a very, very specific uh, <laughs> question answered. And Really, 99.9% .9 of the time, these people are very, very busy people. They're, they're researchers, they're scientists. They know a heck of a lot more than I do. And they're willing to spend quite a bit of time with me um, explaining a, a very specific concept or a very specific aspect 
And when I don't understand, here's the part where I need to explain it to the kids, they're patient and they're, they're really delighted to, to help. And I love meeting people like that. And um, during COVID, I, for the parts of the, um, the rock parts, I was speaking with ge geologists and they said, oh, I have nothing to do right now. So yeah. And, you know, we spoke for half an hour <laughs> about dendrites. Uh, so it, it's really, um, that's my favorite part. That's really the exciting part. Karen, do you have a similar experience or technique to that? Yeah, I, I agree with you, Etna. I feel like all four of us were like interpreters or translators for kids, taking these concepts and making them relatable to their lives. Um, so yeah, diving into the source material. And then I, um, I asked uh, friends who with science writer friends with science backgrounds to read my early drafts to you know try and weed out some of the problems, knock off the rough edges, and then I contacted um, the world expert in in Luca, Dr. William Martin from the Institute of Molecular Evolution in Dusseldorf, Germany. And how wonderful he was to read the manuscript and also to um, review Don's art, which we said is very playful and not supposed to be scientifically accurate in all ways. Um, and, and to provide us with um, feedback and information. But really, I think what I wanna emphasize is that um, like Etta was talking about, doing my research beforehand so that I can ask very pointed questions um, and not waste their time. And <laughs> then they're willing to, um, to talk and participate in the process. I think they're a really important part of the process, the experts that we get the chance to talk to. And you're right, Ada, there's some sites that are just so much uh, more accessible. And another one I'd add is National Geographic. That's so great uh, for accessibility for how you might write for, for children or um, for middle grade readers. Um, Don, Karen just mentioned your illustration. So do you have any research tidbits you wanna share? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think um, for me, I was lucky because I have Karen. Um, Karen uh, was really nice to provide a lot of like article and links uh, throughout the process too. Um, but there is a challenge when we're introducing Luca, where there's not a lot of visual references um, beforehand. So really, we are working around with a description from the scientist um, that Karen reached out to ask what it should look like. And a lot of time, blob, the term blob or flow, are, like throw around and like, hey, yeah, Luca is like a blob. And uh, there is like little cell, like where, yes, in floating in the blob, and uh, I kind of have a fake, like vaguely idea of what Luca one like um, should look like um, in my head. So uh, um, it kind of evolves into what we see now, and I, I, I like it. It's it's pretty fun, and it's kind of like a playful way of taking uh, um, on what Luca. Is. So yeah. And Brittany, I think we have a bit of time before moving on to the Q and A. Um, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah. I would just say, you know, Etta did a lot of the heavy lifting um, for our book uh, for us, which was wonderful, and provided a lot of notes in the manuscript as well as links to like different photo references for me. Um, so I was very lucky to have her help in that regard, um, and I sort of used that as a bouncing off point and did my own research. Um, mostly looking online for really good photo references, um, looking online for videos. Videos were actually particularly helpful in the instance of um, the animal subject matter and just trying to figure out those tricky positions and how um, to portray them accurately in different positions. Um, uh, like there's a gecko, for instance, at the end of the book and I wanted to make sure I got its movements correct while also sort of making it a bit tricky. Um, but yeah, yeah, just lots of photos and video reference for me. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. I would have thought of video as a reference for a static illustration, but it totally makes sense. Um, we are running a little bit short on time, but I think we have time to go for one of the audience questions. 
Um, one of the questions is what inspires you to write books on STEM for kids? Um, I'd expand that for the illustrators too, to what inspires you to work on STEM books for kids. Um, if anybody wants to jump in, raise a hand. Um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Edda, yeah. Um, I, I, I've always been a very curious person and I think that's an important um, feature to, to, to develop in children. Um, and, and I love nature. I, I find all aspects of nature fascinating. And uh, from, you know, why, is, why does this seed develop into <laughs> X as opposed to Y? Karen, that fits in with, with your book. Um, so it's just something that is a passion of mine. Does anybody else have anything to add? Karen, I see you unmuted. <laughs> I think I was either going to be a writer or a scientist. It was like this why branch and what do you, what do, you do? Uh, I'm just fascinated by, by um, s certain aspects of science and um, the challenge of, of writing um, with these topics in a way that's approachable to kids is, is kind of irresistible. So that's the creative challenge and the, um, just the inspiration of the topic, inquisitive, I'd say. And Brittany or Don, do you have anything to add? Yeah, yeah, I would just say that I feel like it's now a more important time than ever to get kids really excited about nature and science. Um, and to get them to appreciate their world and find their place in it. Um, and I just feel like this is such an amazing opportunity to be able to write for kids or illustrate for kids and get them excited in a different way, introduce them to different subject matter that they would otherwise maybe not be exposed to. Um, so yeah, definitely just very passionate about that. It is important. And I think both of these books did that so well. Um, Don, do you have anything else to add? No, but I think I'm just echoing everyone. And I actually never heard of Luca before doing, um, re, uh, before this, working on this book. So I learned a lot throughout the process. Too, so they are important. Books. <laughs> uh, it's always fun to keep on learning. Um, well, thank you everyone for participating in this panel. This was a lovely discussion. Um, and thank you to our attendees for joining us. Um, you can read and review the books we just talked about on Edelweiss and NetGalley. There's links in our booth. Um, and don't forget to come back later today. We have a couple more panels happening in our booth, one at 11.55 and one at 2.50 Eastern time. And don't forget to check out School Library Journal's In the Mix Humor panel at 2 p.m. Eastern to hear about another one of our new fall books, Revenge of the Raccoons, from author Vivek Shreya. So thank you, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.